Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Missions has impacted my faith so much. Um, FaithBridge has given me the opportunity um, to really go to places I've never been and to see the needs of different people. Mission Sends Off to me is more about the church seeing what students are doing and praying over the students that are going out and showing the love of Jesus to others. I think it's just really the support of the church, knowing that um, as a church body, as a family, um, that we are sending these students out, that we support them as a church, we support them in prayer. So in preparation for our time there, we've um, we've been take, we've been meeting about once a month with our team and We've been spending our time doing a variety of things, so just walking through the, the basics of, of raising support, uh, both financially and prayer support. We had a couple of assignments, like uh, our prayer letters. It's where we write letters to 20 different people who we ask for them to pray for us as we go on our mission trips. And the meetings consist of just um, kind of team building exercises and really getting to know each other, really forming those bonds um, and preparing the kids too, preparing their hearts. It's mostly just kind of making sure we have a goal before we go on mission and then kind of how we're going to use all of our strengths collectively to pursue it. So the three teams that we have within our team is um, transportation team, uh, kind of a, what we call a KFC team, kitchen, food, and cleaning. And then there will also be a worship team who's in charge of making sure that the team lives kind of in a lifestyle of worship. Well, we split off into groups like worship team and food team, and then we all come back together and tell each other how it's working and what we're going to do, and then we give each other feedback on we don't want to eat that or, you know, I think maybe pick this song. They have really worked really hard in preparing um, this this trip. We have been blown away. Um, every training, they come with, you know, thinking ideas, working together as a team, preparing. It's It's been really, it's been really awesome. I think that so many times we sign up for mission trips thinking, you know, what is the mission trip going to do for us? And with this, the way that these kids are running it and the way that FaithBridge sets everything up, it's not about that. It's more about, you know, the relationship with Christ and how we can be His hands and feet. The way FaithBridge does it is they give you such, like, an isolated amount of time to really go and make your only focus serving God and serving God's people. Top prayer requests, I would say, are just having those moments, those God moments that where the kids' hearts are really open to having God work through them. I ask for them to pray for my team and just that we can have courage to go to these people. I think that God's going to challenge me this summer to really get out of my comfort zone, to be working with non-Christians and talking to non-Christians and telling non-Christians about Jesus. That's going to be a huge, a huge part of getting out of my comfort zone there. The point of Mission Send Off is really to rally the people of FaithBridge, rally the whole church, and make sure that everyone is kind of, you know, behind you because the church is not just a building. The way God has created the church is it's something that we're, we're all doing together and it's, it's this, this body of believers that's actually em empowering us to go and do what we do. And so to know that you have that support and you have especially the prayer support backing you while you go on to your trip, it just makes what you can do there so much more powerful. Well, hello. Hello and welcome to FaithBridge. My name is Adam McIntyre and I am the high school pastor here at FaithBridge. And whether you're at Klein or you're at the Woodlands campus or if you're joining us online, we are so excited that you're here worshiping with us today. And I'm particularly excited because today is FSM Mission Sendoff, which is a time where we just get to celebrate and pray for 27 different student mission teams comprised of over 300 students, ranging from fifth grade all the way through 12th grade, who are going to be going all over the world to love and serve in the name of Jesus. And this is just such an exciting time. I mean, I've heard so many stories of God doing amazing things in and through our students to impact the communities that they're there to serve. And then I've heard just as many stories of, of students' lives just being profoundly impacted while on these journeys. And I think my favorite part of actually getting to go on one of these mission journeys with the students is to watch as the students slowly but surely figure out 
what it means to actually be the church of Jesus Christ. For them, it's this time where it's like, okay, so you know all the things that you've been learning in children's ministry and in Elevate and Point Break about loving one another and serving one another and encouraging one another and bearing with one another and forgiving one another and having patience with one another. Yeah, you're about to put all those things to practice every day, all day, for a few weeks straight. Right? It's, it's intense and it's messy at first because all those things take practice. And students, they'll get angry with each other and frustrated and they'll get tired, but we keep practicing. And by the end of that mission journey, they, they are truly a family. There's a unity there that wasn't there at the beginning of the journey. There is a genuine love for one another and for the community that they were there to serve. It's truly an amazing thing. And so more and more and more, they begin to look like the body of Christ. And this is crucial because we don't just want our students to go out and do something nice for other people. That would make us humanitarians, not the church. We want our students to learn how to be Jesus to the communities that they're they're there to serve and to one another. That's our goal. And that's not just our goal for students, that's our goal for all of Faithbridge. We want all of Faithbridge to learn how to be Jesus to this community. That's our hope. A few years ago, when my wife and I, we were still just dating, and I got to meet a friend of the family. His name is Luke, and Luke lives in Dallas. He's just a couple years older than I am, and he is a really cool guy, and he's super smart. He's an architect. Like, he actually became an architect. A lot of people say, yeah, I want to be an architect when I grow up. Luke actually did it. Like, he's designing buildings in Dallas. Really cool guy. And when we first met, we hit it off really quickly and we became friends uh, pretty fast. And one day when we were hanging out and we were having a great conversation, right in the middle of the conversation, he gets this serious look on his face. And he says, so why do you work for a church? Like, do you actually believe that stuff? That question kind of came out of nowhere. So I was taking a few seconds to gather my thoughts. And then he, he says, I'm an atheist, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. No, Luke, I didn't know that. But, and then he interjects again. And he says, I hope this doesn't mean that we can't be friends anymore. To which I burst out laughing because I thought he was joking, but he wasn't joking. And my heart sank as a result because that told me so much about his previous encounters with other Christians. I remember thinking, where did the church go wrong to make you think that Christians are only friends with other Christians? How did the church fail you in that way? And so for the next few hours, we ended up talking about Christianity. It was mostly him asking me questions and me doing my very best to answer them. But Luke is a really smart guy, like I said, and so his questions were tough. It felt like this really intense pop quiz. And, uh, (laughs) but, you know, throughout the whole thing, I was feeling pretty proud of myself because I thought I was doing a, a good job of answering his questions, of giving thoughtful responses to his questions. And my hope, my prayer was that by the end of our conversation, maybe at the very least, his perspective on Christianity will change just a little bit. And so towards the end of our conversation, Luke gets this serious look on his face again, and he goes, so you actually believe this Jesus guy is real? Yes, Luke, I do. I believe that Jesus is very real. And he looks right at me, and he says, with all due respect, introduce me. That statement kind of hit me. It stunned me. I didn't really know how to respond at first. And in my head, I'm thinking, that's what I've been trying to do this whole time. I've been talking to you about Jesus for hours now. Like, what do you want to do? Do you want to shake his hand? Like, I don't know what else you want. But it brings up a great question. How can we introduce people to the very real person of Jesus Christ? Let's open up our Bibles to Romans 12, verses 4 through 5. This is a short section. It'll also be up on the screen. Romans 12, 4 through 5. Paul says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. The job of the church is to become one body in Christ. We are all very different people. We have different backgrounds, different upbringings, different cultures. We all have different gifts and talents that God has gifted us with, but we should all have one singular focus to become the body of Christ here on earth. 
Paul says as much in 1 Corinthians 12, 27. He says, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Another way you can translate that is to say, you are Christ's body on earth. That's what we are. And that should be our singular focus. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are to love the world the way that Jesus loves the world. We are to serve the world the way that Jesus serves the world. Uh, there's this incredible poem by St. Teresa of Avila uh, that she wrote to the church. She says, Christ has no body on earth but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ's compassion for the world is to look out. Yours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. And yours are the hands with which he is to bless us now. That's why Jesus says in John 14, 12, truly, truly, I say to you that if you believe in me, you will do the works that I do. The church is called to be Jesus to the world. Not just talk about Jesus to the world, not just write songs about him or TV shows or make shirts about him. We are called to be Jesus to the world. That is what we are called to do. That, and we're not going to be perfect at it. We're going to mess up a lot. But that's the goal that we should be striving after. That's our goal here at Faithbridge, to be Jesus to this community. And that's what we're trying to teach our students. Because once we learn how to become the body of Christ here on earth, then we can introduce people to the very real person of Jesus Christ. So as I mentioned before, Luke hit me with that statement that kind of stunned me momentarily. With all due respect, introduce me. And so I thought about it for a little while. And my first response that came up in my head was to say, well, you know, Luke, it doesn't really work that way. But I knew he would immediately call me out and say, no, 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 no that's a cop-out answer. You can't say that. So I thought about it a little longer. And I said, okay, Luke, how about this? What if I tell you how I was introduced to Jesus? Would that be Okay. And Luke said, yeah, that sounds great. Why don't you tell me how you were introduced to Jesus? And so I did. Uh, I, grew, I was very fortunate to grow up in a very loving household with parents who really wanted me to know Jesus. And so I was saved at a Rebecca St. James concert when I was 10 years old. And she did the whole gospel presentation. She called everyone forward and I filled out the card and I said the prayer and that was it. And I was a Christian, I guess, from that point going forward. But for whatever reason, I just really didn't like the church growing up. I just really couldn't stand it. My parents, they took me to church with them every single Sunday. And every single Sunday, they made me go to youth group. And I hated it. I hated going to youth group. I was that kid in the back with his arms folded and his bad attitude written all over his face that said, I just don't want to be here. I was every youth pastor's nightmare. <laughs> me now would have been very frustrated with me back then. <laughs> Uh, I just, I really didn't like the church at all. But I was great at acting like a Christian. And I did that all the way through high school. But when I got to college, I quickly dropped the act because I realized none of this stuff seems real to me. I don't really think I believe in any of this Jesus stuff. And so I became a closet atheist essentially. My parents didn't know. None of my friends from high school knew because they were all Christians and I was afraid that I would just terrify them if they found out. So really only my college friends knew, but I can vividly remember some weekends whenever I would, whenever I'd go home because I felt homesick or I needed laundry done. Thanks mom. Uh, or whatever it was, I would go home and then I would go to church with my parents. And I remember sitting in the service and I would look around at people while they were praying and I would wonder, who are you talking to? And then I would watch them lift their hands and sing to the sky. And I would think, who in the world are you singing to? There's no one here. You're singing to a ceiling. You're singing back to the band. Right? It just didn't make sense to me. So that's where I was at that point. And so by the, towards the end of my sophomore year of college, a friend of mine dragged me to a Bible study. I mean that quite literally. I kept telling her, I'm going to hate it. If you make me go to this thing, I'm going to hate it. And I def definitely don't want to be there. And she made me go anyway. And I was right. I hated it. I couldn't stand it. It was the most boring, awful thing I'd ever been to. But at the end of the Bible study, a guy named Chris, who was the leader of that Bible study, he pulls me aside and he starts trying to have a conversation with me. And immediately my guard goes up. 
I wanted to get out of there as quickly as possible. I didn't want to talk to this guy about anything. And so most of my answers are yes or no. Uh, you know, I kept averting eye contact, that kind of thing. But then he asked me, uh, so Adam, what kind of music are you into? Like, what kind of bands do you listen to? <laughs> I said, oh, well, I listen to bands like Metallica and Iron Maiden, you know, stuff you really, really wouldn't be into. And then he looks at me, he goes, I love those bands. I listen to those bands too, which was shocking because... Christians can't listen to Metallica, right? Like, that's a rule. I'm pretty sure of it. Like, you're, not allowed, you're not allowed to listen to Metallica. But after he said that, we started talking about music, and my guard just started slowly coming down. And, and we, talk, we ended up talking for a long time that night. And somewhere uh, in the middle of that conversation, he found out that I kind of sort of used to play the guitar at one point in my life, and I still remembered like four chords. And so he was like, hey, I lead a praise band for this small church I'm a part of, and we have worship practice on Wednesday nights. You should come and play with us. And he's like, you know, it's, sometimes we just jam out for a while. It's like a lot of fun, and you would really love all the guys there. You should come. And so long story short, after a lot of pestering, I finally said, yes, okay. I will come play the guitar uh, at your Wednesday night practice with you guys. And so I did. And uh, I, I went, and I was terrible. I was the worst, but I had a blast doing it. And he was right. Like, I ended up loving all the guys that were in that band. And one guy in particular, his name, is, his name is Mike. He was the bassist. And he and I just really hit it off instantly. We were the same age, and he was a really cool guy. He was, a, he was going to HBU studying biblical languages and Christian theology, so he had that going against him in my mind. But other than that, <laughs> other than that, he was a really cool guy. And we got along really well, and we became fast friends. And so over the next few months, Mike and Chris, they texted me and they called me and they invited me to things constantly. And before I knew it, I wasn't just playing around in the worship band with them on Wednesday nights, but I was playing in the worship band on Sunday mornings. And then Mike and I, we ended up hanging out all the time for months. And we started doing this thing that we later called theology walks, where we would walk around the neighborhood until three o'clock in the morning, usually. And I would just vent all of my frustrations that I had about the church and about Christianity, and I would just tell him about all of my doubts, and I would ask questions, and he would listen, and he would sympathize, and he would do his best to answer my questions, even if the answer was, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Right? And so, before I knew it, here I was, this guy who really didn't like the church growing up, and who had given up on Christianity altogether. And now I found, my, found myself spending a majority of my free time at a church willingly. I wanted to be there. And this church was tiny. There were maybe about 80 members there total. And I got to know all of them quickly. And they all showed me grace and kindness and love. And before I even realized what was happening, I found myself surrounded by people who genuinely cared about me without any kind of agenda. Like I almost immediately felt like I was a part of their family. And I can't pinpoint exactly when it happened because it was a very gradual thing. But suddenly I would find myself playing guitar in the worship band, not just for the fun of it, but I found myself actually singing the words. And as I was singing these words, my heart was filling up with something meaningful and something eternal. And suddenly, I was, after all these months of theology walks, I began to open my Bible because I wanted to. And instead of reading scripture with this cynical, critical, skeptical mindset, I began reading stories about Jesus with curiosity and wonder and awe. And I just wanted to learn more about this Jesus guy. And I was getting to know him during that time. And so after months and months of this church pursuing me and loving me and serving me and introducing me to Jesus, one day I woke up and I thought to myself, oh no, I'm a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> and my life has never been the same since, to be completely honest. And every once in a while, doubt and skepticism, things like that still creep up into my life. But I can tell you this with all honesty, Jesus is as real to me today as my wife, Kathleen. I know him. 
I truly do. I know him. The church, they loved me and they pursued me. And as a result, they led me to know Jesus. They loved me in a way that showed me the love of Christ. They served me in a way that was perplexing, which is exactly what Jesus did, did, did does now. <laughs> they just accepted me unconditionally. They made me a part of their family. They responded to my fear and my questions and my hostility and my brokenness with love and compassion and grace and kindness. And my heart was softened as a result. And I came to know the truth that their love for me was an extension of Jesus' perfect love for all of us. So Luke sat there listening to my story and he had this kind of curious look on his face. And I concluded by telling him, Luke, Jesus loves you perfectly too, whether you know it or not. And that was kind of it. There was no big conversion moment. Nothing drastic happened. That was kind of the end of our conversation. And our conversation is still going on. Unfortunately, Luke lives in Dallas, and so it mostly happens through Facebook messaging. But I keep encouraging Luke, Luke, try to find a church. Try to find a community who will love you the way that I was loved. And then I keep praying that there is some church out there who will love and pursue Luke the way that I was loved and pursued. Because here's the thing. There are millions of people in this world who don't know Jesus. And my bet is that for most of them, it's because they have never been properly introduced. In 1 John 4.12, it says, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. I particularly like the New Living Translation. It says, no one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. The church truly becomes the church when we love in, a, in the same way that Jesus loves, when we pursue others and serve others the way that Jesus serves others and pursues others. And that is what we are trying to teach our students when they go on, the, on these mission journeys. That is a main goal. That is the main thing that we want them to learn. And it's not always easy. And in fact, it's often not to love and pursue others in that way. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes patience, it takes resilience, and it takes the willingness to accept a lot of rejection and to, to keep loving and pursuing anyway in the face of that rejection. One of the best examples of this, one of my favorite examples of this, is the sixth grade Mission of Yahweh journeys. Now, the Mission of Yahweh is a place in Houston where women and children can go to escape things like abusive relationships, or poverty, or homelessness. And the Mission of Yahweh does an incredible job of helping to get these women back on their feet and to get them jobs and to make it so that they can support their families on their own. And when we bring our students to the Mission of Yahweh, they ask for one thing from us. They say, we want you to come in and we want you to spend time loving and serving the children that are here. That's all they want from us. And it's not as easy as it sounds. In fact, it's quite difficult. And so before we ever go to the Mission of Yahweh for the first time, we have to train our sixth graders on how to best love and serve these kids. We have to let them know that uh, many of the kids in the Mission of Yahweh, they've experienced a level of abuse and pain and poverty that we can't really fathom. We can't really comprehend it. And some of the kids there don't even really know what it's like to be loved and served. And so we tell our students, when you first get there, you're going to go in and you're going to love and you're going to serve and you're going to pursue these kids and they might completely reject you at first. They might act like they don't want you there. They might just completely ignore you. They might get frustrated and angry with you. They may even try to hit you. They may say things to you that are going to hurt your feelings. And we are going to respond to all of those things with grace and compassion and love. That's how we're going to respond. And sure enough, the first day usually goes just like how we would expect it to go. We show up, and at first, a lot of the kids there don't even really talk to us. Most of them are kind of suspicious of us. They don't really know why we're there. And some of them, it's very apparent that they don't want us there at all. And so it can be incredibly difficult to engage with these kids at first. 
And so after that first day, we come back here and we regroup with our sixth graders and we debrief the day and then we start strategizing for the next day. How can we better love and serve these kids tomorrow? What can we do to love and serve them better tomorrow? And so we'll start, ha we have a brainstorming session, us and the sixth graders, and the sixth graders come up with these amazing creative ideas on how we can go in there and love and serve these kids better. And so the next day we go in and we execute our game plan. And then we do, we do it again the next day, and then the next day, and the next day, and we keep going. And I wish all of you could see how different the last day is from the first day. It's night and day. Right? On the last day, we show up, and when we get there, the kids are waiting for us at the door. Like, they're all gathered around the window waiting for our van to pull in. And then as soon as we walk in, the room just explodes with laughter and screams, and all the children there are just kind of hanging all over us as we're trying to walk in, and they're, like, grabbing onto our legs. And, uh, and we know all of their names, and they know all of ours. And all of them, they're, like, tugging on our arms, asking us, can you come play Barbies? Can you come color with me? Right? Can we build another blanket for it? Can we have another dance party? Can you please come back again next week? And so by the end of that mission journey, when it's the last day, everyone is just so emotional. Many of us are crying in a very embarrassing fashion. <laughs> it's just, it's a tough day. No, no one wants to go. Our students genuinely love those kids and the kids know it and they love us back. And the entire time we're there, we are telling them, we love you because Jesus loves you even more. And the entire week, we're teaching them these stories from the Bible, and they're listening to what we have to say because they trust us, and they know that we love them. And so by the end of that journey, when it's the last day, and we're kind of debriefing the entire week with all the sixth graders, we tell them, you have just gotten a small taste of what it looks like to be the body of Christ on earth. And we don't want that experience just for the students. We want every single person here at Faithbridge to know what it looks like to be the body of Christ here on earth. Because my bet would be that every single person in this room knows someone who has never been properly introduced to Jesus whether it's at school or work or in your social circles or even in your own family, everyone knows someone who needs to be introduced to Jesus. And listen, if you know someone who doesn't know Jesus, it's not enough to simply just invite them to church. I was dragged to church my entire childhood and it did nothing for me. It took Mike and Chris months of intentionally loving me and pursuing me before I could ever come to know Jesus. And so if you know someone who doesn't know Jesus, you can't just invite them to church three times and when they show up, throw your hands in the air and say, well, I tried. That's not going to cut it. You need to go be the church to them. Go to them. Our community is filled with people who are just in pain who need to know the healing that Jesus can offer them, that can only be found in Jesus. There are people in our community who are afraid and who are anxious and who are depressed, and they need to know the peace and hope that can only be found in Christ. There are people in our community who are broken, who feel unwanted and used, and they need to know the infinite value that they have in Christ. Go to them. Allow the Holy Spirit to work through you to love and to heal and to restore, but you have to go to them. And I know that sounds intimidating and it sounds difficult and it sounds overwhelming and at times it's going to be all of those things. But that's why Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit and that's why we do this as a community. All of us together, unified, joined together in the Spirit with one focus, to be the body of Christ here on earth. That is our goal. That's, why, that's what we're going for. That's why we have grow groups who meet outside in the community and not in this building. If you're in a grow group, start brainstorming together. How can we be Jesus to our neighbors in this subdivision? What can we do? That's why we have classes like Starting Point 
where we try to teach you what it looks like to actually be Jesus to this community. That's why we have things like serve team, where we can actually come and practice those things together. We can practice being Jesus to this community. And here's the beautiful thing about all of this. There is no better way to draw closer to Jesus than to learn how to be Jesus to others. There's just no, other, there's no better way. And, and don't get me wrong. I mean, it's one thing to learn and to read and to listen to sermons and things like that. That's all very necessary and very important. But it's another thing entirely to actually put what you've learned and experienced into practice. That is when Jesus truly comes alive. And that's what this world needs. This world needs Jesus to truly come alive in and through the church. We need to become the body of Christ here on earth because there are so many people who don't know Jesus. So let's introduce them. Let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, I am just so incredibly thankful um, that you are a king who wants to be known. That, um, that God, you want us to, to know you intimately. You want us to have an actual living, breathing relationship with you. And God, we're so thankful for the perfect love and grace that you offer us. And so my hope and my prayer today is that every single person in this church is compelled, feels compelled to go out into our community to all of those who are broken, who are hurting, and who are in desperate need of you, in desperate need of your love and the forgiveness that only you can offer. I pray that we are compelled to go out into this community and to love like you love and to serve like you serve and to be your hands and feet so that we can introduce others to you, so that others can come to know you through your body. God, that's our hope and that's our prayer. We love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with high school pastor Adam McIntyre. This Sunday was Missions uh, Send-Off for high school ministry, and we were excited to uh, join Adam in, in commissioning the uh, FSM mission teams going out for the summer, and Adam delivered a great message called Meeting Jesus. And you talked a lot about your personal story mm -hmm. and how you can use that to be the hands and feet of Jesus and introduce mm -hmm. people to Jesus. And we had a couple questions coming in. One, about how do you determine your gifts? And then two, if you're ready to get started and you're challenged to be the hands and feet in Jesus, where do you start? So right. let's start with um, the passage that you talked about in Romans. Um, you talked about that the scripture teaches that the church is one body mm -hmm. with many members, each having their own gifts. Right. So how does one go about um, discerning and figuring out what are my gifts? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, let me say first, though, that the main part of being the church, uh, the, the main requirements is that we, like I said in my sermon, is that we just love and serve and pursue. And so regardless of whether, regardless of what gifts God has gifted you with, everybody is called to do that. Everybody's called to love and to serve and to pursue others. And um, like I said, I think far too often we fall into the trap of just simply inviting people to Jesus and talking about Jesus to people. Mm. When in reality, what we should be doing is inviting those people into our everyday life. If we are the church and if we are the hands and feet of Christ, um, then we need to invite others into that family, into that community, uh, because that is where they will truly be introduced to people or in introduced to Jesus. And that is where they'll truly get to know him. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's like I said, there's so many different ways you can do that. Uh, number one would be joining a grow group, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just so important to what we do here. And, um, and it's inside of grow groups that you can, um, you know, come up with strategies together of, you know, mm -hmm. what can we do to best reach 
um, our neighbors and to be Jesus to them. And that can look like a thousand different things. I mean, if you know that a lot of your neighbors watch the Texans, then throw a huge Texans viewing party. Invite your grow group, invite all your neighbors, and just get to know them first. And just uh, without any kind of agenda, just love them um, and, uh, and let them get to know you. And then just keep doing that. Keep inviting them to things. Keep pursuing them um, and, and things that aren't just church-related uh, functions. And then slowly, as they get to know you and trust you more, and they know that, man, these people really do love me. Uh, and they, they're not just trying to sell something. They're not just trying to push an agenda. That's when you will earn the right to then just start sharing Jesus with them. Um, and as far as gifts, I mean, there's so many different ways that you can try to figure out what your gifts are. Um, I mean, there are, there are assessments that you can take online um, where you, you take like a, a quiz and it takes about an hour. And um, afterwards, that test will kind of help you figure out what are my spiritual gifts. Uh, sometimes you just have to take a step back and examine your own life. Like, what are my, what are my interests? What, what do I love to do? For me, uh, it was, I loved studying theology and then I love teaching theology. And right. so I feel like one of my strong gifts is teaching. Um, for someone else, if that just sounds um, not like, a, like a, not a lot of fun, then, yeah. right, exactly. <laughs> if that, that sounds like something they don't really want to do, then that obviously is not going to be their gift. Mm -hmm. uh, they might be much better on a relational level of just talking one-on-one -on -one to people. Um, they, they, might have, they might be better at worshiping. They might be incredible at just going and praying for people. Whatever it is, sometimes you just have to take a step back and say, okay, what, do, what draws me closer to Jesus? What mm -hmm. stirs my affections for Jesus? And then that usually can hint at what our spiritual gifts are. Yeah, and I think you definitely said it best there in relationship, um, right. whether it's in a grow group or with a mentor or someone very trusted, a great way to do that is to talk through those kind of stirrings that you have in your heart with someone who can maybe see things in you Absolutely. that can be used for the yeah. kingdom as well. Definitely. So um, if someone was challenged today um, that heard your message um, and has begun thinking about um, just really pursuing this and getting mm -hmm. out there being the hands and feet of Jesus, um, uh, you mentioned some in your message, but if you could just talk through a few of those um, just practical ways here at FaithBridge even that we could um, sort of onboard people to begin really going out and living that mission. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I in my sermon, I think I mentioned three different ways that we can kind of jump in. Uh, the first, as I mentioned earlier, was grow groups. Uh, absolutely vital. I, I mean, if, if you're not a part of a, a grow group, um, even if it's not here at FaithBridge, but you need to be part of some community, community. that exists yeah. outside of a building um, that is actually out there in the world, uh, surrounded by people who don't know Jesus, where you can, like I said, brainstorm with that um, community on how you can best reach those people that are surrounding you. Um, how you can best come to know them and love them and then draw them into this family. Uh, I, I think that's the most important one. Uh, and then one of the other things you can do, especially if, if you have just become a Christian recently, is we offer classes called Starting Point classes where from Genesis to Revelation, we kind of walk through the Bible. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of that class is just to equip people um, to go out and be Jesus to the world. That's what we're trying to do. That's why we learn things. We don't learn them just so we can know more things. We learn them so that we can take what we learn and go put it into practice. Right. Um, which then leads to the last thing, which is you can actually join a serve team. We have so, so many different serve teams at FaithBridge that do so many different things, either in FaithBridge or out in the community. And so, um, I mean, there's just so many different options there. If you want to start um, with something like you can join the parking team and just help park. Uh, people on Sunday mornings, or, I mean, you can go as far as to actually join one of these mission journeys. There's mm -hmm. student and adult mission journeys that go all over the world um, to serve and to love in the name of Jesus. And, uh, and like I said in my sermon, there's just no better way uh, to learn how to be Jesus than to just go out and start practicing. Yep. Essentially, that's what it takes. Mm -hmm. It takes just a lot of practice. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's what we're trying to draw people towards here. Um, and yeah, so grow groups, uh, starting point, and serve teams. Those are the three best ways. Great. Yeah. Awesome. And a great message today, too. Thank you. And thank you for your questions today and joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.